Okay. So this is lecture 33 of ECE 1512. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're actually going to put math to all the cool stuff that we've looked at so far with respect to spread spectrum systems that are di direct sequence spread spectrum. So we talked about the, the bit period. We talked about the chip period. We talked about number of chips per bit period. And we talked about how several of the spreading and despreading architectures that are available out there in order to accomplish spread spectrum communications. If you all notice in the last lecture, the, the, main, the main dilemma is finding out where the chips begin, right? So we did either correlation-based approaches, match filtering-based approaches, a combination thereof. We had a chip rate clock. We need to know where to sample and, in order to despread. So it wasn't very trivial. Right? And imagine that on a low-cost cell phone. It's, it's a tall order to fill. So what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to put math now to the problem, and we're going to look at the issue of how well DSSS deals with jamming. Okay? So what Neil mentioned in the last lecture about how, um, you know, what happens when you have a narrowband jammer, how does that influence the performance of your spread spectrum system, this is the math behind it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the following model for our baseband signal. Okay? So V of t, so we have either a plus or minus 1, and it's multiplied by a, a simple rectangular pulse shape, but it could be anything. It could be raised cosine. Everyone likes raised cosines, right? And what happens is we have a train of these delayed pulses. So in the end, we have rectangular pulses with, that are either plus or minus 1 in amplitude, da 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 and then we have this beautiful thing. So G, T is the pulse shape for the information bit. C of T is this PN code sequence. It's a sum of all these PN code pulse shapes, which happen to be rectangular in this case, that are shifted versions by the chip period times C of n, which is our PN sequence, like 1 or minus 1. Now, so does everyone get that? Mathematically? So far, so good? Nothing, nothing scary, right? So the way this looks like, if I have a rectangular pulse, my V of t will look like this. Right? So 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, 5t, 6t, 7t, right? So t, 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 And then our c of t, so this pulse shape here is plus 1 g of t, right? This guy here is going to be minus 1 g of t minus t, and so on and so forth. And then c of t is going to be okay. It's going to be that guy. And this guy here is plus 1. So that's your CI. And that's going to be P of T. This guy here is going to be minus 1. P of t minus tau, uh, t, and so on and so forth. So that's what these two equations are doing over here on this screen. So now with the math, what we do is we do our, our spreading. And the easiest way to do it is we take V of t and C of t, multiply them with each other, right? And they have those pulse shapes. And we cosine modulate it to some center frequency, right? And then there's also an AC. That's some sort of amplifier gain or something like that. And so what happens is we can, we can change things slightly. We know that V of t and C of t, if these are rectangular pulse shapes, OK, so they have a plateau over a certain chip period that's either 1 or minus 1. The combination of these two, when it's 1 and 1 multiplied with each other, what do you get? 1. When it's minus 1, minus 1, you get a 1. When it's minus 1, 1, you get a minus 1. When it's mi 1, minus 1, you get a minus 1. 
So another way of representing this equation, this is kind of like a little bit of a trick. Phase. Make your phase either 0 or pi. And what that does is you don't need the v of t minus the c, uh, the v of t times c of t. All you need is cosine, all that stuff. And is it 0 degrees phase for that chip period or pi degrees phase for that chip period? And what that will do is what's pi? Minus 1. So you're basically using the phase to do the spreading for you for this entire thing. So that's an equivalent way. You can represent this. If you can come up with, here's the mapping rule. So basically, you get 0 degrees phase when vt times ct equals 1 for that chip period, and vt times ct equals minus 1 for the other chip period will give you pi as a phase. When you despread, this is the beauty. What happens when you have ct squared? It's 1 all the time, subject to proper sampling and synchronization and timing. Correct? So all you get at the end of the day is this beautiful bandpass signal, V of t. Now, this is the question that Neil asked, what happens if I have a narrow band interferer? And what the answer is, let's add one. Let's add i of t to the mix down below, this guy here. So if we do that, when we despread, <gasps> when we despread, we have c of t multiplied by poor i of t. And what that does is essentially spreads out the interference. Now, I want to know, like, you know, I mentioned in, in the last lecture, what happens is, suppose you have that spreaded interference signal, how much of that actually impacts things? And what happens is, let's say you take your despreaded information signal and you filter them out. You only get a snippet of the interference noise from that spreaded out interference signal. So now, let's say I of t has a very specific shape. Let's say I of t is a delta. So in this case, I of t uh, in frequency is a delta. So in the time domain, Let's say it's a cosine modulated thing, right? So let's say we put a tone, right? A cosine, a cosine tone. So it has a certain amplitude value, aj. It has a frequency. So let's say the jamming frequency is fj. Now, how does this look like? What's the power of that? So first of all, if we spread i of t, what happens is it becomes wideband interference. And we know what the power spectral density is going to be. We're going to call the power spectral density of the interfering tone, J naught. And J naught essentially take that energy, spread it, spread it wide right across that band, right? And so it has the same power. So let's say PJ is the power of the jammer, but now whatever our, our uh, PN sequence is, the, the, the W, right, um, of the bandwidth that we spread across, we now take the, the, the power of the jammer divided by the bandwidth that, that we, the spreading bandwidth, that gives us now what our power spectral density is for the jamming power. So it's only a fraction, right? It's spread across a very wide band. Now, the total interference power at the output of the demodulator, so um, J naught times R, so it's some sort of ratio. What happens is in the end of the day, the, as I mentioned before, like, well, let me draw it. I'm, I'm just doing hand waving. I'd rather do drawing. Okay. Ooh, hoo. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> it's just like Windows. <laughs> it's like reboot, restart. You know, Linux has no problem like this whatsoever. No. Except that you can't run Windows products, or Microsoft products on it. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So what happens is, as I mentioned before, so remember that J naught now looks like this. So that's the height, J naught in, in the frequency domain. And so that's after spreading. And then here's my desired signal. And as I mentioned, suppose I have some sort of filter. Right? So what happens is I only take a narrow band portion, 
of J0 in with me. So in fact, what I'm doing is I'm spreading out the signal across a very wide band and just carving out the snippet that I can't take out. But it's very small in relation to what the original jamming power could have been for a narrow band jammer. Beautiful. Beautiful. So <laughs> so that's what happens. That's why when you look at this guy here, the J0R, what this tells you is how much of that energy actually makes it through back into your despreaded signal. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a fraction of what it could be. So if we drive the probability of error, what we need to do is, first of all, we have sort of this S of t. And this S of t is essentially that sequence of C of t times G t t uh, cosine. So it's basically the, the spreading sequence multiplied with the data sequence passband, it's modulated to the passband by cosine 2 pi f c of t. And we know what g of t looks like, right, in terms of the, the energy and such. And we know what the spreading, the pseudo random noise, uh, the PN code generator, what it's producing. And so let's say, first of all, that the chip sequence, so this is an assumption. We assume that the chip sequences are incorrelated with each other. So I don't know what the next chip is going to be. It probably has no bearing on what the previous one or the next one is going to be. So they're uncorrelated. So what happens is um, we now have this property that if we take E of CNs and CM, and M and N are not equal, they're treated individually. And it turns out that if, it, if, if what, what's the mean of CN, what's the mean of CM? Zero. Because they're either plus or minus one, they average out to zip. So as a result, if we do this, and we also throw in a propagation delay, that's what I'm so scared about with spread spectrum communications. If we have now a very timing sensitive waveform, and I have delay, propagation delay, how do I know to exactly lock on to where to, right? So at the same time, we have this issue here. We have our interference. Cosine and a related component, which is a little different, right? So let's assume, oh, this is such a big assumption. Perfect, perfect synchronization. Yeah. You know, reality, do we have perfect synchronization? Who here touched the software-defined radio? Uh, how many of you ever had perfect synchronization? No, just kidding, yeah. In my dream, sleeping one time, oh my god, it's perfectly synchronizing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And then my dog licked me and woke me up. He says, oh, I think Master is uh, very delirious. Do you have a fever? Oh, you know, I like Captain. So what happens is we de-spread. So we saw, let's say we take from that last slide from the last lecture, lecture 32. And what happens is uh, we, take, we take the second implementation. Remember, so the one with the should be TB, not TC. Okay? So what happens is, we take the signal R of T, it's D spreaded by C of T, and then we take the cross correlation, and then we take the output and sample at T B. Okay? So that's how this guy should work. If we do the math, what do we get? What we get is the following. So what happens is now we're sampling at the bit period because of this implementation. And so now we have to look at what is the interference contribution at that sampling instant. So if we look at this guy and we expand him out, what we see is the following. So right now it's at TB. So let's work this backwards. So the entire operation that we see here is as follows. So here's our, so that's our interference. That's the spreading. And that is the, uh, uh, modulation to FC, right? And that's, our pul that's the pulse shape that we multiplied with in the receiver structure, right? Sorry, so this is despreading, but we're actually spreading it. This is the pulse shape we're trying to correlate with. We're integrating, ah, see, here's, well, that's why I made a typo, TB. Mm. So what happens is we integrate across TB. And so what happens is, let's say now, let's, let's decompose this. So what's C of T equal to? 
C of T is equal to C of N, the sum of all these C of N's, and these pulse shapes, what's dependent on T? Just the pulse shape. C of N is not dependent on the pulse shape, neither is the summation. We extract it out. So well, let's, let's revisit. So what I'm going to do is do something really crazy. I'm just going to split this up onto two sides. Ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. Then when we divide it into sum? Mm, no, no, but l l l well, let's, let's work this out because I think, well, l l let's say if we take this guy, okay, so we have y of i, tb, right? So this is the correlation across the, that, that, that interval from 0 to t. <laughs> so what happens is ct, i of t, G of T, T. I'm glad I have this on the other side. Okay. What happens is this guy here is equal to what? P n sequence, right? So it's, um, uh, yeah, n is equal to 0 and the number of chips. So chips, so how many chips? So it should be LC minus 1 or something like that, correct? Correct? LC minus 1. And then this should be C n, and then this should be P T minus N T C, right? And that fits into T B. So now what happens is we plug him in. I'm going to use the small eraser. <laughs> Not that mistake again. And then I of t, g of t, t cosine 2 pi f c of t plus phi d of t. Now, these guys don't, don't, they don't factor into the integration, so we, we take them out. So when we write it out, now we have, and it's a linear operator, we still have the integral, we still have p of t minus t i. We still have I of t, we still have G of t, and we still have the cosine, blah, 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 G of t. So does that, so that make sense? So, so what happens is what we're doing is we're doing all this jazz, but more importantly now, what's kind of interesting about this? So what happens is, notice we have a G of t and we have a p, we have these two guys here, right? Um, here. So if we have that situation, what ends up happening is that other side breaks down into V of n, right? And so we've, when, we, when, we, when we have that situation, and we know what v, we represent V of n in terms of the I cosine business, what happens is that now what we want to do is let's take this further, one step further and calculate what is the probability of error. What's the statistical characteristics? What's the mean? What's the variance of this thing? It turns out that this thing has zero mean. So if you look at this guy, um, it's either ones or minus ones, right? And they're equally likely to occur, right? So what happens is there should be, it should, the mean should be equal to zero. And if we calculate the variance based on the statistic that we know, the correlation between the chips, what we end up getting essentially is this expression down below here. Um, the variance is going to be equal to two EB over TB, LC, the expectation of V squared. Yeah, uh, you know, law of math. But what, it, what this comes down to, basically, is we can take the interference term and describe it in terms of its mean and variance through the same sort of math we've seen time and time again using just the basic definition. If we now dig deeper and look at something like this, like, you know, the narrowband sinusoidal interferer, right, and go through this math, right, what exactly is this EVN, an EVN squared business? It turns out, it comes out to these values. So there's a law of math that's in between 
But again, it's, it, it's essentially the same standard stuff, like where you have, you employ trigger. So what happens is you take the VN definition, which is equal to this, and then I say, OK, now, what do I do? So what is IT equal to? Plug that in. I get this expression. Now I have a cosine A, cosine B. So now I rework it into now cosine A minus B, right? And then I have a constant that I take out of the integration. Then what happens is I perform the integration. I get this expression here. I know that phi, uh, sorry, theta J variable, right? And so as a result, because it's uniformly distributed. So that's the thing. The interviewer, interviewer here has some sort of random phase, right? What happens of him? What's the average of a periodic symbol with a uniform phase? And zero, right? Just like before. And what that expression there. So you now have the statistical characterization of what the narrowband interference looks like post spreading. And so if we take signal to noise ratio at the detector and you plug it in, you have this expression over here. So what happens is once you get like you know the the uh, the expectation of the y i t b squared, what happens is we saw from the last thing. So we know we know that it's dependent on E V squared, which we just solved in the last line, plug it in, you have this expression, and the SNR detector is the bit energy divided by the noise and interference energy. Yep. This assuming there's no Gaussian noise? In this case, there's, uh, uh, so this case we're assuming no Gaussian noise. It's just straight interference power. If we throw in noise, it would be S I and R, and you just add, exactly. So now, what happens is, um, if you have this expression, so now you have the SNR at the detector, um, and you can do a little bit of, um, wiggling around, like um, in terms of like the mathematics. One thing that you notice is that LC. There's a name for that. It's called processing gain, right? So processing gain is the more you spread your signal, which is tricky because that means you have to have a ridiculously fast chip rate over, let's say, a very long bit period. But the advantage is you spread over a very wide frequency, which means when you unspread, if you have a jammer, that jammer spread like beyond like a huge amount, and you only get a sliver of his power. So what, what is the lesson here? For the same trans, uh, you know, jammer bandwidth and energy, if you have a higher processing gain, the less of an impact he or she will have on your transmission. Simply put, he who spreads more has less interference at the end. Ah, seriously. So if you spread more your signal, what happens is any signal that appears in your band, if you do the exact same spreading with the exact same processing gain at your receiver, negligible performance. So this is what the next example is going to be about. Because everyone's probably wishing for an example and an end to this lecture. So the example is, the signal-to-noise ratio requirement at the detector to achieve reliable communications in a DSSS system is 13 dB. The jammer, sig jammer to signal power at the receiver is 20 dB. Determine the processing gain required to achieve reliable communications. So this sounds like Martian to everyone probably at this point, right? Yeah, a little bit. What happens is, so what we do is we look at what is PJ versus PS? What is, the pro what is the jam power versus the transmit power ratio in dB? And we're told it's 20 dB. So let's put it into a linear domain. 100, right? 100 times. Then we're told that the SNRD is equal to 13 dB. Let's bring it back to the linear domain. It turns out that's 20, a value of 20. We take our expression there. So the SNRD is equal to 2 PS over PJ divided by LC. We isolate for LC and gain 1,000 or 3 dB. Simply put. So if we're told what our ratio, target ratio is, 
between the PJ and the PS, and we're also told what the, um, um, so, so we, we're told that guy, and we're also told what the SNRD is. And so what is the SNRD? The SNRD is the, uh, the, you know, the, the SNR required for reliable detection. So let's say this is what we need to do the detection correctly. 13 dB, that's my SNRD. And then, oh yeah, and here's my transmit power to jammer power ratio. And now all you do is you isolate for a processing gain. Let's do another one. So let's say there's something called the jamming margin, right? And it's the interference signal of a jamming signal we usually sometimes refer to as EB over J naught. And so that is given by this new expression that's derived from the previous. So really, with all this math, the last several slides, what you should focus on, I'm not going to ask you to rederive those things. You should know how we got there, but the punchline. What is the PJ over PS? relationships between all of them are. So if we use this, it turns out that the PJ over PSDB that defines kind of the ratio between how much power we're investing in jamming versus how much power we're investing in transmitting. And it's, it's a dB expression that's related to uh, w, w, your bandwidth over the rate in dB minus EB over J naught in dB, right? And so what happens is, let's say we require a jamming, uh, no, sorry, an EB over J naught dB of 10 dB to achieve reliable communication. So let's say this is my bit energy versus jamming power spectral density in dB is 10 dB. What processing gain is in required to provide a jam margin of 20 dB? So that's my P, PJ over PS, right? Or PS over, which one's that? PJ over PS in dB. So work backwards, you get in linear domain. I have all these expressions, and I plug it in, and it turns out, ah, processing gain is also 1,000. So with that, this concludes lecture 33 of ECE 5312. And thank goodness, because I think everyone's burnt out. So, so